Welcome to WVU Marketing Horizons, hosted by Ruth Stevens and Cindy Greenglass. We are grateful to WVU, who offers renowned online master's degree programs in marketing communications. And this series is presented by the Reed College of Media as part of their ongoing marketing series. Thank you for joining us today. Cindy, I'm so happy that we have a terrific guest today, Roger Mater. And he has been a friend of mine for the last couple of years. I actually recruited him to speak in my new product development class and learned that he's also a professor at the School of Visual Arts in New York. And he has a business called Ampersand that specializes in so-called growth by design. Yeah. And so he applies design thinking to business problems in a really interesting way. And one thing I learned about him that's so interesting is he and his family summer in Nova Scotia at a place called, wait for it, Mater's Cove. No kidding. Yes. So I learned that it's because his forebears, he he tells me that they were a family of criminals who escaped to North America from Switzerland in the late 1700s. So you could talk with him about Canadian matters if you wanted to, but let's at least get Roger in here to help us understand the whole concept of design thinking and where is it going? What do you think? Yeah. Does he say a very often? (laughs) <laughs> in his conversations let's wait and see <laughs> shall we <laughs> let's chat okay good roger would you mind coming in now i am more than happy to eh? um <laughs> i was uh, i was raised in the u.s so you will not be hearing the canadian uh, All right. particulars but thank you very much ruth it's a pleasure cindy thank you so much for hosting i am um delighted to be having this conversation because, as you say, Ruth, the, the application of design to solve business problems is still relatively new. There's, it's been popularized around this label of design thinking, uh, which is really a misnomer in a sense. Design thinking, <clears throat> it emphasizes the thinking because it's suggesting that you have to think about things in a different way. But in fact, one of the most important aspects of it is that you're doing things in a different way. It's more design doing than it is design thinking. Hmm. And I recently spent a year with uh, Subway, one of my clients who I advise on innovation as their chief marketing officer globally. So the world's largest restaurant group. Uh, And it was because I was asked to do that because the work of design thinking is so closely aligned with the core competencies of marketing because it begins by understanding your customer. It begins by doing deep empathy to understand what are the end needs of your audience so that either in Ruth's class, you can conceive products that will better serve their needs or in Cindy, your program, we can, we can bring them the messages that connect the value of what we're doing with the needs that they, that they may have. And they, they, we use the term in the in term of art uh, of user needs, but in fact, it's very often not perceived as a need. It is a preference, it's, it's, a, it's a bias. It's very often subconscious. So it's not like you can just go interview people and say, what are your needs? You have to go out into the wild like an anthropologist and study and see the points of frustration, the aggravation. Now, the, it helps me to understand things by grounding them in a bit of history. So you should know that design thinking is really just the application of design theory, which has been around since as long as people have been drawing pictures to figure out how to build a building before putting it in the sky. Uh, so think, you know, at least ancient Greece, um, we're using applied math to figure out how to uh, conquer gravity. And that same set of skills that are trained today as industrial design, very often um, in engineering and mechanical design and in it, graphic design and visual design and interaction design, which is what I teach, which is the interactions that human beings have very often through technologies. All of those are using the same premise that I must understand you rather than understand me. And it overcomes a very human bias that we tend to wake up in the morning thinking about ourselves and we spend our lives fretting about trivial things that are important to us and inconsequential to most of the world, almost everyone in the world, except you know those closest to you. 
because we are a selfish animal. And so it's a, and marketing is the least selfish exercise you can do well. And product design, much the same way. If I am truly doing my job well, I am like the most perfect gift giver. I am working really hard to understand this person that I love more than myself. And how can I make sure that I'm, when I, when I package up something for them, when I cook a meal, think of the classic Italian mother cooking a meal for her family and how disappointed she is when they don't love some aspect of it. She's <laughs> eventually will force feed it to them if necessary. <laughs> it's that same sort of sense of love in, in the preparation that we should be doing when we're creating messages or when we're creating products or offerings or experiences. And we do that by knowing the other person deeply, by understanding what they need better than they do, anticipating. It. It's one of the things that makes Amazon so both wonderful and dangerous because they have to, they have so much data to understand what our purchase patterns are. Much like Netflix knows what to recommend for me in my, in my video feed, because they've got all the demonstrated behavior that I might not even be conscious of. They probably know what time of day I prefer something, a light comedy versus, you know, some thriller in the darkness of night. They can probably tell you in a way that I haven't noticed how weather patterns affect what I choose to watch. And during COVID, when we're all sort of slammed into uh, communicating through technologies and entertaining through technologies, that stream of data has become much more rich. So how do we get that kind of data on our users. Design theory simply tells you that you have a method that starts with understanding the other, the person that you choose to serve. That's so interesting. What your Amazon angle is evocative and reminiscent of the database marketing world that both Cindy and I grew up in. But I'm still wondering how day-to-day -day marketers can apply design thinking to get better results or perform their tasks more effectively, specifically? Sure. What do you think, let, let Roger? Me, um, let me tell you what we needed to do in my work with Subway. We, five years ago, were brought in because Subway was losing ground uh, against new competition. Places like Chipotle were growing rapidly. When I went to interview him to kick off our project, I said, now tell me about your customers, because this all starts with better understanding our customers. And he stunned me by saying, I don't have customers. My franchisees have customers. I have franchisees. Oh, right. And I thought, well, this is a self-made billionaire. Like, maybe I should pause and give a moment of thought to that. Um, and then I did have a quick revelation. So it felt like five minutes for me. I think it was, you know, 30 seconds or something. And I said, wait a minute, don't you collect revenues from all your franchisees so that you can do central advertising? You know, doesn't the $5 foot long come from headquarters, not an idea from the periphery? He said, oh yeah, we do do that. Yeah, maybe you should talk to my chief marketing officer. That was five <laughs> years ago. So we um, went out into the field to understand the market. Because the other thing he told me was, I don't understand why we're not growing. We haven't changed anything in 50 years. <laughs> I was like, uh, okay, if you said that sentence backwards, it might make sense to you. Um, so, you know, he was ignoring that the world had changed around him. Mm -hmm. And so we went out and showed the executive team the changes that were going on. And we came back with insightful quotes and videos from people saying things like a teenager saying, I would take my, I'd take my girlfriend for a date to Chipotle. I would never go to Subway. Gross. You know, they hear that. They hear that voice of the customer that resonantly. And of course, it's heart sinking when you're, yeah. when you're committed to doing great work and having a beautiful place. And they truly are. I mean, so many people knocking themselves out to be the best, healthiest option that people have at the lowest price. Um, but they were missing the boat that people saw these giant buckets of meat that, that Chipotle does in order to create a burrito the size of your head as a healthier option then, you know, fresh vegetables on a, on a piece of toasted bread, in part because they saw the bread as just being a giant doughy carb load. They saw the meats being sort of cold cut quality stuff that looked like it had been industrially produced. And so, the, so they saw Chipotle where they had interactions with multiple people working like a machine and it was fun and friendly with a modern layout and community tables, everything about the experience connoted fresh 
and friendly that Subway no longer did by comparison. So we brought all that back to them. That was simply about what every marketer knows is I need to go out and make sure that what I'm marketing is actually appealing. Otherwise, I'm just a used car salesman telling you a line and you know, couldn't care less whether, whether the product is worth it. In fact, so I'm going to obscure that fact. So how did design thinking play a role in, in this story? So design thinking, um, in short, the, the method that we use, I'll summarize very quickly as four Ds, and which is trip, typical of all design thinking. The first is to define the challenge you're trying to solve. In this case, it would have been if you want to become relevant and return to growth uh, and do it for a particular amount of money and do it at a particular time period and take a particular level of risk. So you become pretty expert at helping executives figure out the trade-offs. If you don't do that with innovation, they'll say, I want a moonshot and I want it for free and I want it today. Um, and you need to be able to help them understand that a moonshot costs a billion dollars and takes 10 years um, so that they can make the appropriate trade-offs. Secondly, you discover. And this is where we all fall short because intuitively we will jump to the solution. We will go and talk to our agency about, we need to, you know, a new catchphrase. We need a new logo. We need a new message. And you don't know any of that. Go out and figure out what you need. The logo is never the freaking problem. The brand is their experience of your reputation. So it's the experience that needs to change. And the brand might be a small component of that. The logo is almost certain. Um, so I would suggest that they go out and do this discovery. And I'll tell you, that's, that's where all the unique stuff happens. Then you do design, which is much as a marketing group would do the design of a new campaign. We tend to do it like you do in industrial design where you come up with prototypes, really like back of an envelope, come up. I, when I work with my clients, I will give them six answers to the same problem. There's six different ways you could solve it, but they represent different levels of risk and cost, et cetera. Now let's test those like you would with marketing in a focus group. Would you prefer it this way or this way or this way or this way or this way? You start to rank them, you understand the differences. Look, you know, uh, mothers prefer this approach. Teen males prefer this approach. Should we do both approaches differently for each audience, et cetera? Um, thinking one size fits all, you know, is almost certainly going to be wrong. And then the last is deploy, and you deploy these things as though they're not going to work because it's new to the world. You're typically, my work is for creating innovative new offerings. So your deploy process is not about doing a big launch, it is about doing iterative testing and changing along the way your ultimate deployment might be you know, look very little like the first version. Okay, it's more like software, the way that things will be deployed and debugged and corrected and debugged and then you must get another version. Wow, so about, that's amazing. You know, using a software model to do marketing. Think about using a software model to create any kind of product. Wow. Yeah. Especially the part about, you know, deploying it as if it is not going to work. We so often, do testing, right? We talk about you have your holdout, you have your control group, you want to test before you roll out, but you generally don't go into it saying, I expect it not to work. I'm usually testing a hypothesis that I want strongly to believe in, almost like I've biased myself and I hope that the test is perfect because I want to prove my success. I don't want to go out thinking I'm going to fail. Think about how much easier better your life is and your work is if you and your client understand that success doesn't come at launch success is something you navigate to in the marketplace because you can't possibly foresee the needs of all markets and all audiences and thinking that voila you know i've introduced this magical solution is literally setting yourself up for success it's i mean for failure it's it's reminds me of the mistake i still make on Christmas morning when it's like, voila, and my children open their Christmas presents. Like, <laughs> Dad, you know, I hate that. But Dad, you know, this last year. Uh, you know, I, so I have to, I, I have to really do my homework to get that right. And when I get it wrong, I just correct it. Like, uh, believe me, I give no gifts that don't have receipts. <laughs> well, back in 2008, when that Tim Brown article came out, a, a lot has happened since then to your point about the world changing. Do you think this kind of approach to th thinking 
the way a designer does about solving business problems is kind of a fad? Do you think it's here to stay? Yeah, is it I, evolving over time or? It, it looked like a fad at first. It, hmm. because, and you know what else did? Marketing. Um, because, I mean, I'm talking about 50 years ago. Marketing okay. was performed by an advertising agency. You didn't have a marketing department. You didn't have a chief marketing officer. You had people who were somehow special and creative and interesting and knew how to do things with weird new media like television and radio. Um, and you kept those separately because they were experts and they, had, they weren't part of our core business. But over time, they started teaching marketing in MBA programs, Ruth, you might be familiar with this. Right. And pretty soon you were graduating people who were looking for a career in marketing. And they got hired by companies rather than by ad agencies. And then they became expert at bringing in ad agencies and judging them and saying, and, and, and often they would come you know, in through ad agencies and then into companies after that. And it becomes this very permeable career path where it's like, do I go into an agency or do I go into industry? Um, we're seeing the same thing happen. We saw the same thing happen a few years later with strategy. You called McKinsey or one of, the, one of the other big strategy firms, but then they started teaching it. And next thing there's a VP of strategy. When I see that there are people young people clamoring instead of for accounting, but for you know design thinking or innovation or whatever, you can be sure that that is the beginning of a career path right. that you know, will take root. That's so interesting. Now, Roger, are there other specific skills or attributes of design thinking that are useful to marketing? Yes, I think the, we've covered half of the unique approach that you take in this discover phase that you know that the design method all is about the discovery of, of uh, those you serve the other thing that you need to consider is that you have the opportunity to be designing for people who you haven't met yet because they don't yet exist and what i mean is designing for people today means by definition you're going to be producing things that are out of date by the time you launch them um, so how do you anticipate the future? And in fact, you might think of design as being about designing for the future. So we can do lots of work and we've all seen it in demographic forecasts that say, we know that you know, 12 year olds today are gonna be 13 year olds tomorrow and we can kind of forecast what their, what their needs and wants will be. And how do, I, how do I forecast those 13 year olds to be 26 year olds? That's a little bit more speculative, but also super helpful because as I'm designing for 26 year olds today, I can be seeing what millennials and Gen X and Gen Z and Gen Next are going to morph into and I can be designing to solve for those trends. How do you get those trends? We do secondary research that's relatively uncommon. We see it was pioneered in the 1970s by Shell Oil, who was trying to figure out where to dig for, for fossil fuels and they realized that they can plant lots of oil wells and get a bad result if they haven't, um, and they can get bad returns on the oil that they do dig up if they haven't forecasted the future a bit. And so they use something called scenario planning that says, we don't know what the future will be, so what are the probable alternate futures? And think of creating a simple two by two grid right now for today's COVIDian moment, as we see light at the end of the tunnel, and you can imagine on one axis, it would be the degree to which vaccination and other herd immunity factors allow us to open back up. So, you know, on one side, it could be, you know, we stay enclosed for, for another year because of new variants and bad behaviors, or we're open up in no time at all because of mass vaccination and, and good behaviors. And on the other, you might think of local, uh, of US versus international, for example. So, you know, how does that affect us just thinking within our own ecosystem, but recognizing that we live in a permeable global membrane, you know, what does it look like internationally? And, it, and you'll see very different um, forecasts for Sub-Saharan Africa than you will for Western Europe, for example. And so thinking of the world broadly creates many, many more variables. And then you can say, okay, here's what it looks like if we're kind of closed up and we're only worried about the US. And on the opposite extreme, here's what it looks like if we're wide open globally. And if I'm designing for the future, I should make a bet on which of those I think is gonna to come to fruition. If I'm developing a marketing campaign that's gonna be um, taking place in the next three or four months, 
I should say, where will this weird dystopian future of ours show up in that time frame? And certainly if I'm forecasting a year out, I, I could have very different futures. And I therefore should probably have very different campaigns. And maybe what I do is figure out what would be the leading indicators of the future that is, starts to really show up. You, you know, maybe what we should be doing is tracking vaccination rates. Maybe what we should be doing is uh, looking to see which countries are producing vaccine passports. Maybe we should see leading indicators from Israel, which has the highest vaccination rate, has already digitized their, their green passport, have opened almost fully up, um, but for you know, mon monitoring for spikes. So if we look at a leading indicator like that, or a leading worse indicator in, in Brazil, we can start to see how different futures might evolve. This notion of forecasting where the future will evolve means that you start making assumptions about the behaviors of your target audience in those different futures and how would I best serve them. So almost think about taking the personas that you might create for a marketing campaign and split them into those four different possible futures. How is Ruth or Cindy of um, 2022 going to be feeling, operating and thinking in each of these four futures? There's, there's lots of ways to do that. That's a very simple sort of framework to give you the two by two grid. I'm not suggesting that that's the standard approach. What we do is use big data mining to understand the conversations that are happening in the marketplace. Think of it as like a, creating a Google search for the key topics that are of interest to you and see how they're changing over time and forecast that trajectory. So the, in, I mean, not in a straight line because obviously there'll be variables that change it, but roughly if, if, if it continues this way, we're going here, continues that way, we're going here. At the intersection of these two trends, what occurs? It's a really, really valuable thought exercise. And right. getting your teams to rally around defining the future that's going to show up and the needs of our audience in those futures helps you design more accurately for the future. Very cool. Well, Roger, it's really been fabulous chatting with you and gaining these insights. I'd also like to suggest to our listeners that Roger has some terrific videos on YouTube that I've enjoyed over the years. And if you search for Roger Mader ampersand on YouTube, they'll come up right away. They're short, very well produced. Roger, I would congratulate you on your production values there. <laughs> and you can uh, learn quite a lot about the, this concept of using design as a, a principle for us to apply all over the world of marketing. Cindy, do you have any final words or should we send Roger off and thank him? Well, thank you, Roger, for sharing um, your thoughts with us on how to take design thinking and, and make it work for marketers. And uh, you gave me a new way of looking at it, uh, assuming that, not assuming you're going to fail, but not being disappointed if you don't first succeed, right? Try, try, try again. And iteration, just like you do in product development. So I think that was a really eye-opening way to look at it. Uh, and it takes some of the pressure off of all of us as marketers who tend to be, you know, overachievers and we want to succeed. And, and optimists. We're optimists and you know, we're being measured every day um, on whether we you know, met the ROI or the KPIs. And so we need to take that into consideration here. Uh, but Roger, I hope you'll have some nice visits uh, way up yonder into uh, uh, Canada this summer if uh, you get up to Mater's Cove. And thanks for joining us. Thank you, Cindy. I look forward to uh, getting down to um, WVU to see you there. Um, I have a college age or an aspirational college age son. And so we're about to be doing the campus tour. So NYU is easy. That's we can walk over there. So <laughs> right. thank you both very much. Thank you, Roger. Ruth, he was so interesting. Thank you so much for introducing me to Roger. And um, he has a wealth of experience in this area and really helped to crystallize for me, how design thinking can be applied to marketing because so often I think of it as IT or product development and engineering and an IT. I don't think of it from our standpoint, 
But when he said marketers are the least selfish people um, who, you know, can do these <laughs> things so well, I thought, oh, well, oh a maybe he was just flattering us. <laughs> Perhaps he was. He was. <laughs> We're the ultimate perfect gift giver. I don't know. I think I've given you a gift or two you like. <laughs> Have you ever? <laughs> but it, it, he was making the point that to be successful, we must be empathetic and thinking about the needs of our target audience. And those are all principles of marketing success. So I, I thought that really resonated. Absolutely. Because how often do we say either to our clients or to our own internal constituents, if your product or service is does not apply to you. We say, we're not the target audience. You cannot think of it about whether I would buy it, whether I'm interested in the positioning of it. You have to keep reminding yourself, this isn't about me. It's about you, your audience. And so um, that that was, a, 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 I thought, a clever way for us as marketers to think about it. We already do this. It's part of who we are. It's in our DNA to always be thinking what is your audience thinking and what's their acceptance going to be of that point of view? So that was really a, a, a good topic that he brought up for us. Right. But what isn't necessarily in our DNA that he brought up in connection with the four D's, mm -hmm. define, discover, design, and deploy, especially the, the design and deploy stages he said required a lot of testing, a lot of iterative experiments and going back to the drawing board and, and making adjustments. And I'm, I'm thinking maybe that's not that easy to do for all marketers. So you and I having been trained in direct and database marketing where testing is part of everyday thinking it's not really, doesn't really come naturally to all marketers, don't you think? I totally agree with you. Sometimes the, uh, the audience doesn't allow us to do testing. Like if you're marketing into a niche or a small audience where if you don't get it right the first time, you may not get an opportunity to do it a second time. That sometimes is difficult. And another thing that comes up uh, as a barrier is if your your company or your if you're in an agency, your client doesn't want to fund multiple iterations, and they say, "Well, just put it out there." I've seen that happen too frequently. Absolutely. Well, and let's be, you know, we're all also worried about um, self survival here. And so the idea that success doesn't have to come at launch, if you are in an agency or in a service environment, if it's not successful, will the client keep you like, there is a certain amount of, uh, I don't know, maybe stress around, I can't put out a test that's not successful and tell my client it didn't work and say, well, we learned a lot, but I spent a lot of money learning that that wasn't successful. Um, yeah. So there's some risk there. That That's a good point, Ruth. That's a tough one for some people. And it was neat that he gave us permission, not only permission, he, he explained why we need to assume that the thing isn't going to work and expect yeah. that and, and turn that to our advantage that it's kind of empowering for, for us to think that way. And it also it relates to another neat topic he brought up about designing from the future. I, I really loved that idea where he said, let's do basically scenario planning to try to anticipate different possible outcomes or situations and then try to anticipate where the market is going or market segments are going and see if we can serve those markets as they emerge according to our our estimations or our our predictions yeah it reminded me of what you sometimes see in uh, the military where they do these 
gigantic um, alternative realities and scenario planning. If this happens, what would we do? If this happens, we would do this or that. And a lot of that is hard to wrap your head around. But with way he mentioned big data, the fact that we now have technology and the ability to use machine learning and AI to create what if scenarios at mass scale. So think about doing these predictive analytics that could say, if this happens, where would it take you? Where would this audience end up? I don't think we could have done that effectively five years ago even. Um, so I was really pleased to hear that they're using things like big data analytics and machine learning to get to some scenario planning for the future. Yeah, really, really neat. Well, I'm thinking I, I want to go read more about this subject. I think the, the designers can teach us a lot about how to be better marketers. For sure. And also that we as marketers shouldn't be intimidated when we have conversations with our own internal constituents in IT, engineering, accounting, medicine, where they're used to thinking in this manner to say we as marketers bring a point of view that's uh, relevant to design thinking instead of feeling somehow inadequate because we don't come through that you know, Six Sigma maybe process that right. um, others are more accustomed to. And this thinking is not limited to the startups and innovators, the new product people, it has applications across the entire company and across the entire marketing spectrum. Exciting, huh? It is exciting. And now I understand how to be, I liked also when he said, it's not just design thinking, it's design doing. Yay. It's not just that we're thinking about it, we're actually gonna make it happen. And I love that. So Ruth, let's make it happen. How about if we talk about our, our three little piggies, our three best takeaways from this uh, conversation with Roger today? You... Well, I, the first one I think would be this process that he called the four Ds of defining, discovering, designing, and deploying. That is something that we can take away and apply very quickly. Absolutely. And picking up on that, like you said, um, being able to iterate, I'd say that is a second one. So often we go from define the challenge and because so many of us are problem solvers, that's our nature. We go from, I've defined the problem. I'm going to go directly to the solution. I'm going to design the campaign and go, but we miss that important middle step of the discovery and the design before you go out and deploy. That'd be my second one. And, and as a third one, probably the scenario planning concept or thinking backward from what we think is the future or various options or, or anticipated types of futures and building our strategies from now going in that direction. It's a, a mindset that is I think new to marketing and can really help us meet the evolving market need better than we have in the past. Completely agree. This has been really interesting, Ruth, and it opens up a whole new way of looking at how we as marketers can be thinking out the front windshield, as we said, this is our horizons, mm. and how we can try and predict for our clients or for ourselves, where the future goes when it is so uncertain and gives us a pathway to follow through design thinking for what may lay ahead. Here, here. Thanks, Cindy. Thanks, Ruth. You've been listening to WVU Marketing Horizons, hosted by Ruth Stevens and Cindy Greenglass. Please be sure to visit go.wvu dot edu slash mc today to view our upcoming conversations, listen to previous discussions, and subscribe to receive updates. Mm -hmm.